Uh, let's move on to session number one, the reaction to what we just heard from Jeffrey. This uh, session is titled Current Urban Adaptation Finance Landscape Challenges and Opportunities. And we have a fantastic group of speakers joining us today. Let me uh, welcome Sami Waba, who's the Global Director, Director of Urban Disaster Risk Management, Resilience and Land Global Practice at the World Bank. Cynthia Rosenzweig, Senior Scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute and the Earth Institute at Columbia University and the co-chair of the Urban Climate Change Research Network. Mark Watts, the Executive Director of C40 Cities. And finally, Enrique Peñalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Let's start with Sami. Uh, Sami, as part of the World Bank, you deal every day with issues regarding urban adaptation. Now we all know, and we just heard from Jeffrey, the urgency of this topic. So from the perspective of the multilateral development banks, we know that funding for urban adaptation is limited. What are the plans of the World Bank to address this challenge? Um, thanks a lot, uh, Mauricio, and good to join you and Jeannie and everyone over here, many friends on, uh, on the call. Um, so I think I've, I've taken note of three messages from Jeffrey's presentation. Global uh, climate finance is a debacle. Uh, the second is, uh, it's not just about finance. Uh, there's a lot more to do on the planning front, the decentralization front. And point number three, integrating adaptation and mitigation is critical. So let me take those three and, and, and work with them a little bit. So urban, if, if, urban, if global climate finance is a debacle, then you know, urban uh, adaptation finance is an even more of a debacle. And let me elaborate a little bit. So uh, in accordance with the CCFLA uh, state of the uh, city's climate finance report of 2021, which was just published, and we uh, at the World Bank were the author of chapter two on the enabling environment, uh, tracked urban climate finance, meaning finance by the MDBs that is actually tracked in terms of climate co-benefits is about 75 billion uh, US dollars uh, on average in the latest two years. Of this tracked finance, what was spent on adaptation was 7 billion. So basically it's 9% of the total. So 91% was on mitigation and 9% was on adaptation. Yet, as we all know, I mean, adaptation is the critical need for low and middle income countries within those countries, of course, the cities, uh, because, I mean, they've done very little in terms of contributing to emissions and they're paying the price of this increasing severity and frequency of disasters. And, and to give you a couple of examples from cities that we work with every day, uh, the city of Nouakchott in Mauritania, uh, basically the combination of sea level rise and the coastal zone erosion means that the water is advancing on the city, is eating up 25 meters of land every year. So it's expected within 20 years to uh, the, the city will be a waterfront city, even though it's not on the waterfront. The other one is, of course, uh, Jakarta, which is sinking 10 to 15 centimeters uh, per year, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a combination of sea level rise and uh, the, the land subsidence because of the groundwater abstraction they're doing. And it's also a city that is severely threatened. So you, you take, there's many such examples. Now, for us at the World Bank, uh, we've just issued a new climate change action plan for 2021 to 2025, where we've increased our ambitions. We've, in, uh, I mean, we're already the largest multilateral financiers of climate action, and we've committed to doing 20% more. But most importantly, for the purposes of this meeting, we've basically pledged that at least 50% of what we invest in terms of uh, climate co-benefits will be on adaptation. Um, and I, I do believe we're, we're probably the biggest part of those 7 billion that are out there. Now, on, on the finance front, so, I mean, so let's start with the MDB. So yes, I mean, it's critical that the MDBs scale up their financing, but if you compare those 75 billion on climate finance, relative to the needs, which some people estimate at one and a half trillion per year, others at two trillion, other at four trillion, even if it's less, it's clearly a drop in the bucket. So, so these investments in terms of climate co-benefits, meaning investing in development projects that have 
benefits in terms of climate change and mitigation are important, but they're not going to solve the problem. You take concessional financing, and that's the Global Environment Facility, uh, the Green Climate Fund, the uh, Clean Investment Funds, so, so SIF, GCF, and, and GEF. That's about $3 billion a year. So again, these can at most help in demonstration projects, in moving the needle, in you know perhaps tilting the, the financing profile of a project, making it from land bankable to bankable. But again, they're going to end up falling short. So it leaves us private sector and public sector, basically. On, on the private sector, and, and you know, there's a lot that is said about how the private sector will be the solution to all adaptation problems. But to be perfectly honest, much of what is needed in terms of uh, urban climate adaptation within cities falls in the realm of the global public good. If you want to reduce the flooding risk in a given city and you know, uh, climate-proof the infrastructure against sea level rise, it's not per se something that is that the private sector finds remunerative. I mean, there are ways by which the private sector can contribute. You know, if the government puts in the upfront investment, the dikes, the embankments, the whatever investment to reduce the flooding, land values will rise. So if you have a system of land value capture, there is a way of, you know, uh, basically recouping part of this investment so that the private will have contributed it will end up in you know, more densification, more land development. So there is a way to capture that. But you need you know, proper land and property rights. You need you know, proper planning systems. Uh, you need not to build in the floodplains, like Jeffrey said. And you know, those things are not a given in every city uh, that we work uh, with. So it leaves us basically the government. And what is it that can happen in the government, you know, so uh, David spoke about the intergovernmental fiscal transfers, and the end for me is the game changer. If we can help, I mean, we know that most cities in the developing world rely on the transfers from central government. If we can help shape those transfers to make them predictable, to make them transparent, to make them formula based, and link them to climate outcomes, you know, basically asking that cities, you know, prepare a climate uh, smart capital investment plan against which they get additional transfer. Asking that cities, you know, uh, I, I don't know, undertake several metrics or milestones in the implementation of the plan against which those transfers are happening. Then you're incentivizing, if you will, more action within cities. But of course, it needs to be coupled with the technical um, assistance. And Besides that, there's the notion of creditworthiness. Jeffrey spoke about it, how very little uh, in terms of countries and, of course, in terms of cities that are creditworthy. So needing to help put them on that pathway of creditworthiness because that's, that and on-source revenue generation, et cetera, are going to be, if you will, um, a, a very uh, important way forward. But lastly, let's not forget, and I'm wrapping up here, let's not forget what cities can do that's beyond finance. Number one, what they procure. So the moment you, inter you think about green procurement, you think about shifting the needle with what they consume, what they procure, there's a lot to do over here. What they regulate in terms of land development, in terms of what gets built, what gets, what gets built where, and what gets built how, uh, what type of infrastructure uh, is planned, and then what their competences are, and that's working with the national government to uh, support uh, decentralization. Lastly, a plug for nature-based solutions, going back to what Jeffrey said about integrating mitigation and adaptation. I think it's a critical uh, instrument going forward by which you know, cities can, uh, A, achieve a lot on, in terms of mitigation and adaptation. They're good for reducing air pollution, for um, you know, reducing the urban heat island effect. They're, great for flood protection and stormwater runoff, but they also are very helpful in terms of working with the communities because, you know, with payment for environmental services, you get lots of communities also engaged along the way, and they can become also an instrument of uh, inclusion, so uh, um, a plug for nature-based solutions. And with that, I hand it back to uh, Mauricio and Jeannie. Uh, with my apologies in advance, I had another meeting that I'm participating in, so I'll be in and out, but uh, back to you, Mauricio and Jean. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sami. Uh, you have uh, touched upon very, very important aspects, one of them being um, credit worthiness, how that becomes a real obstacle for many cities uh, around the world. I remember the figure that uh, the World Bank presented uh, regarding uh, 
how only 20% of the 500 largest cities in the developing world are deemed credit worthy. And that poses a, a big problem when accessing uh, finance for climate related projects. Thank you so much, uh, Sammy. Cynthia, what's your reaction to what Jeffrey and Sammy have just uh, mentioned? And particularly, I would like to ask you uh, about how to bring the private sector into the equation. We have heard from Sami the perspective from multilateral development banks, but we know that the private sector is also a very, very important source of financing for cities. How can we bridge uh, the private sectors to cities? Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, and uh, hello to everyone. It's great to be here um, and to discuss together this very important topic of finance for adaptation in cities. Um, for, I want to be sharing um, in my uh, remarks um, some emerging findings from the Urban Climate Change Research Network's third assessment report. So this network has over a thousand experts and they're from small, medium and large sized cities. And as we saw in Melissa's comment, it's important also that they're also from small, medium and large countries as well. And the, this, uh, what, what uh, the, this um, group of authors are bringing forward is really the information needed for city decision makers to actually make progress to the challenges so very well uh, put forward by Jeff um, and um, and Sammy. Um, just to uh, first, uh, before I get to the private uh, side, just to say what are what some of the nitty gritty information that's really actually needed for finance to come in. Uh, so the first thing is that, that we need to know adaptation to what? So as there's a lot of rhetoric and hand waving as we see and hear about the increases in disasters, the increases in um, extreme events around the world, sea level rise, coastal flooding for coastal cities, for example. So one of the things that we work on concretely, and this, by the way, is a link to the private sector, of course, and the insurance part of that, is you have to know what are what do cities need to adapt to. So our in the USERN, um, the USERN has a team of urban climate science experts. And uh, what they do is they actually provide the climate projections, at climate observations, what's happening now, and climate projections in the future uh, uh, for, all, for cities around the world. This is the kind of information that's needed so that the private foundation can private funding can then come in because they actually know what the challenges are. It's not just it's hard to do private investment for um, vague hand waving uh, threats and risk. So the first thing is um, contributing to enabling private finance by urban climate science. The second is, the second link is bringing in concretely, how do you do this? And this is something, again, USERN and ARC3 is working on with this amazing group of urban planners, architects, and designers. And what they do is that what they do is they conduct in cities around the world, both during COVID virtually and uh, and um, we hope now um, being able to uh, to really share these want this wonderful long term relationship building, so that building neighborhood and metropolitan scale can actually uh, the capacity building for developing truly effective projects can go forward. And this is again what is needed for private fund funding to come in, right? You have to have here's a real. If this is here's something that's really well thought out. Again, not um, not just hand waving. 
Um, the next key to the private fund funding, um, of course, and by the way, this is the key to everything, is social equity and the process of engagement within cities as well as across um, across the global south. And of course, let's not forget small island developing states. So here, equity in private in the private funding, right? There's, a, I think, a lot of linkage to the public funding, but now in the private funding, um, how to, we're developing how to engage so that the, the equity, what's the process of engagement with neighborhood groups, with activist groups? And it's challenging, but absolutely essential for these projects to actually be as effective and the finance to be effective. Um, finally, I want to say that um, what, what our governance, uh, so we have equity experts, we have the urban climate scientists, we have the architects, designers, these are the groups that actually really do have to all come together to make this work. Um, we have equity experts uh, writing a new chapter on equity um, informality, another very, very big challenge uh, in cities and development. And then I want to highlight what the governance folks, experts are doing. So here, building on what Jeff was bringing forward and Sammy, this, we call it the, the, the telescoping scales. All cities are, they have, they have within their city, they, they have their metropolitan region and they have their relationship with their national government, obviously. And I think that one of the things that, that could be an outcome from this uh, great think tank workshop, um, that, that Penn and others are, are, are organizing is to encourage a more constructive partnership between the national levels and the city levels, because sometimes in some places those are antagonistic. How can we bring cities and their national governments together? I think this is something also that um, university, the role for the university researchers uh, and, um, and actions could, could help with this. Um, so, and then to end, um, um, we also have a program and it's actually uh, being developed by Franco Montalto in Philadelphia, who is the, the director of the USER North America Hub. And this is a program to bring university experts and their cities together. So when we think about the vast challenges that we heard from Jeff and Sammy around the world, how are we really going to provide all the information needed as Jeff was calling for? And by the way, we're working on a global urban stock take that the nation states are doing where uh, Eustern is, is, is uh, undertaking a global urban stock take. It's to bring and to build the capacities for work between the university experts in basically there are universities in virtually every city. Um, and and we, are, we are developing programs to link the, the, the urban experts and the city decision makers together for long-term relationships. Because one of the things is climate change challenges and the need for resilience and mitigation is going to go on for a long, long time. We need to be building relationships and enabling relationships uh, so that the knowledge can continue to go forward. And I guess I think Mark New is going to speak after. And of course, the role of the city networks. I've been talking about the knowledge providing networks, but um, uh, and uh, in particular, you soon. But of course, the city networks are, are have such an amazing role to play in this capacity building. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Certainly, uh, building strong partnerships, multi stakeholder partnerships. Uh, is absolutely key. Cities cannot do it alone. Uh, therefore, the collaboration between cities and different levels of government, the private sector, international financial institutions, uh, and the academia, of course, is, is absolutely key. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. Now let's uh, move on and um, hear from the perspective of a former mayor, uh, former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa. You have, uh, for many years, been a very strong advocate for sustainable cities. So can you share with us the importance of urban planning when looking at a comprehensive strategy to address climate change uh, in cities and, of course, 
to access to climate finance. Welcome, Enrique. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, and thank you, Jeannie, and to all other participants. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to very quickly go over uh, some of the, the issues of this financing that has been talked about. Uh, some projects clearly have to be national government finance because, for example, coastal cities, coastal cities which have at the, are at a high risk of having worse flooding problems, they need such gigantic uh, investment projects that they are out of the reach of, of, of cities. Uh, but uh, in other cases, uh, cities are getting uh, financing, for example, from the World Bank in the Bogota, for example, uh, we got uh, important finance, a few hundred million dollars to do uh, uh, the river banks around the Bogota River, which used to cause uh, flooding or had flooding risks. Uh, and that works basically well, but I'd like to emphasize in a different issue and the most important thing. Developing, con most cities in the world are growing and developing world cities are growing very fast. Even Latin American cities, which are uh, populate, where the population is not growing so much anymore, will more than double their size over the next 40 or 50 years because the, the households are smaller and because there are more institutional buildings and all that. So, uh, but this is in Latin America. Cities will double their size and in, in Africa, they will multiply 10 times their size and in Asia, five or six times. So the main issue to, do, to prevent global warming, to do sustainable cities uh, is for cities to grow in the right places and in the right way. Uh, and this means to intervene land. Uh, and the, the fact is that we have been doing the cities wrong everywhere in the world almost, but particularly in the de developing world. And even before global warming, cities were growing in the wrong places. They were growing and many uh, 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 poor people were forced into steep hills or into flooding areas, uh, flood prone areas, simply because the land, the, the, the good land was in the hand of a few wealthy people and so the, the, the land was there, but it could not be used for the cities to grow in the right places because clearly there was much inequality. Uh, so the basic democratic principle of, uh, of uh, public good prevailing over private interest was not being met. Uh, and, and this is why we have cities which have a lot of flooding problems everywhere uh, it was just mentioned about Jakarta, for example, or Manila, or many cities, or, or, or else in steep hills uh, now. So in my opinion, we have to have planning, like was done in New York or Barcelona uh, 200 years ago, or 150 years ago, not uh, for 10 years in advance, but for uh, 60, 80 years in advance. And clearly, it cannot be the private sector which decides where cities grow. It cannot be the private sector, it cannot be landowners or speculators or, or, or even some small municipalities which decide that they don't want the, the city to grow there. So the first thing for sustainability and for preventing and for adapting to global warming is for cities to grow in the right place. And for this, first, we need long-term planning. And second, we need an effective control of land. Land controlled by part of, on the part of government uh, at whatever level it is. And for this, uh, I like to say that, for example, the World Bank or the, in, uh, in multilateral financial institutions, they finance many things. They finance roads, they finance housing, they finance hydroelectric power uh, projects, uh, but they do not finance land banking. Land banking for the long term, with a long term perspective, to buy land for government to, for example, uh, the, the New York Central Park, New York Central Park 
was done around 1860. And uh, I, I really doubt very much that uh, anything similar has been done uh, in 98% uh, uh, of developing country cities over the last 50 years, nothing like that. Uh, and, and the idea is not just to buy land for parks, but to buy land, to have full control of land. Clearly the market, the market does not work in the case of land around growing cities, because here the principle of the market does not work. We can increase prices, land prices, all we want around the cities and the supply is not going to increase. And for the market to work, we need to have an increasing supply in response to higher prices. Therefore, we need, so uh, my, fine, what I'm, I, I like to emphasize in only that point, only that point, cities are go growing in the wrong places. They are growing in the wrong places because of private property and the market. Private property and the market lead cities to grow in the wrong places and in the wrong way, without adequate public spaces, without large parks, and they grow in high risk areas. They grow in flooding areas, they grow in steep hills with high uh, landslide risks. And so government needs to intervene much more. Part of that intervention has to be through buying, buying of land in the part of public authorities. And for that, at this moment, it's very difficult to find finance, long-term finance, to uh, control the land where cities should grow over the next 50 or 60 or 70 years. Thank you so much, uh, Enrique. Um, we have a meeting format, so I would like to encourage you to make questions and comments. Um, I see a comment from Rich Quodomine. Would you like to share it with everybody, please, Rich? Does anybody have a question or comment? Michael? Michael, please, Michael Berkowitz. No, 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 no question. I was responding uh, to Carla uh, and her point about uh, Singapore uh, land banking. An interesting interaction between market based in Singapore, an interesting interaction between market based forces um, uh, and like and, and using incentives. Uh, so Singapore gave people more room to build if they built in certain ways, um, uh, to en Enrique's point, but also a lot, you know, regulation and mandates um, that help not just let that, you know, market structure run wild. Hola. Thanks, thanks, uh, Michael. Cynthia, um, any reactions to what uh, Enrique has just mentioned? Very, very interesting about the land banking. Um, and what I'd like to do is invite um, maybe um, uh, Enrique or Michael or their colleagues to um, contribute case studies uh, for the uh, ARC 3.3 case study docking station. It's an online tool. Um, that um, that really documents this. And I think we need this for finance, right? Specifically examples of case studies in cities for interventions such as land banking. And it's not just all pie in the sky and how wonderful these things are. It's uh, what works, what doesn't work, what were the lessons learned? So um, um, I invite everyone to, um, if they have case studies, because one of the things I do from, again, what, uh, what we've learned from our city network and others is that cities learn from each other. Um, that's the peer group. So um, having, um, having these kinds of tools that um, really share, can, can share uh, lessons learned, um, I think is, is a very good way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Rich, uh, would you like to comment on this, please? Sure, I believe you're referring to me. 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure we had the right rich and that there wasn't multiple here. <laughs> uh, even, uh, morning, everyone. My name is Richard Quotemine, uh, City of Philadelphia, and I'm a senior analyst who works at the Department of Public Property, but also with uh, also with Climate Change Task Force here at the city. And I was also a delegate to COP26 in Glasgow. So one of the many things that is the greatest paradox of being a person in public service is that we are often with the political tides given tools. I have a, uh, a climate change management tool that Trust for Public Land and Billy Penn Foundation uh, helped us create. I have capital and construction management tools. I have project management tools. I have asset management tools. I have CAD to GIS tools. I have a ton of tools. But the one thing we haven't been able to do is connect all those tools in a common framework. So say that, for example, we wanted to consider a large scale uh, heat island reduction uh, project using say non-monoculture forestry and place it in an area that has an equity issue We'll take Eastwick as an example in Philadelphia, Southwest Philadelphia prone to flooding uh, and also is lower income. How do we get people to understand that we have almost in some cases too many tools and not enough intelligence and integration of those tools combined with finance to make them actually work together as a team? I'd appreciate the panel's thoughts. Thank you. Yes, I'll definitely uh, jump we'll in. <laughs> so, Rich, yeah. thank you so much. Um, I Welcome. think this speaks also to Jeff's uh, comment about we don't know enough. We don't know enough about the city needs for adaptation, let's say. So um, uh, I'm going to borrow from, I think this is really, really an important point coming out. Um, in, you're right. There are all these tools out there. And the, by the way, there's tool proliferation, right? Everybody is making tools and making tools. But in order to really use them, the I would say there needs to be an, a concerted effort for an inter integrated project assessment project to use them. And the elements of these are um uh so you know i'm just thinking also back to NPC new york city panel on climate change that bill selecki and i led for 10 years right so even there we had this chapter and that chapter and this chapter and that chapter it's only when you design an integrated assessment with common with common baselines com first of all common objectives common baselines and then climate scenarios, I mentioned, remember about the climate scenarios that USERN provides. And you basically, it, it takes funding, it takes dedication, it takes long-term, but at the end of the day, when you do an integrated assessment, you actually then have what Rick, Rich is asking for. So I think it's a fantastic idea, you know, we, I, we would love to work with you and I'm sure you know Franco Montalto and, you know, to really take a step and show that this is actually what's needed. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, Lolita, please. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm not feeling well today, so I'm off camera. My name is Lolita Jackson, so I, I wear two hats on this call. I'm a fellow of Penn Perry Wellhouse, and I'm actually a Penn alum, but I also was the climate diplomat for New York City for five years. I know many of you on this call, and a hello to everyone. Um, the first thing I want to comment on, since New York's been mentioned a lot, I worked for the mayor's office for 15 years, so I lived through every plan that New York City ever did, and one of the bases of those plans was Cynthia's fantastic work as the head of the New York City panel on climate change, because all of our work in New York City is always been based on the science, particularly with Michael Bloomberg being mayor at the time, who was an electrical engineering major, which most people don't know. So he cared much, much about the science. Um, also making sure the community, and I see some comments about that, making sure we did extreme community outreach and Michael's nodding because he was probably part of that as well when he worked for New York City. We always made sure we had all the inputs from all the neighborhoods, particularly after Hurricane Sandy. Um, 
And then we had a 1NYC advisory board, which Michael, Cynthia, and um, Jeffrey were all on, where we made sure we had inputs from various sectors. That's actually codified in law in New York City. You have to have an architect. You have to have someone in the labor movement. You have to have someone who's um, a climate scientist. And because of that cross-sectoral conversation, it made our plan stronger and richer. Um, so, so those are things that uh, people are talking about during the call uh, that are important. But now I, I work in the private sector now. I fled. Uh, with a new administration, I felt it was time after 15 years to give another person a chance. So now I work for a private equity firm that invests in climate. So I'm wearing two hats here. And one thing I will say, a couple of things around what we need from cities to be able to invest in your cities, procurement, make it clear, make it so that we understand it. Don't make it, you know, a year long before we even hear back from you. Um, and I know that, that there's some places that that's the case, but that makes us not want to do it. So just understand that. Secondly, shovel ready means something different to you than it does to us. So clarity on terms and, and making sure everybody's uh, in sync on that. And realistic timelines and accountability. Uh, I did work uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers in my past job, and those timelines are really long. Uh, so, you know, private sector, a lot of times they, they want to see a return a little bit shorter. So thinking through, you know, realistic timelines where someone's going to see some return on their money. And I'm in a firm where we don't necessarily need the highest return. We just need a steady return. So really being clear about that. And I'll just stop there. But I think that working on both the city and the private sector sides, there's a lot of opportunity. But I think a lot of times they're talking past one another and not with one another. Um, Cynthia has been really instrumental in helping to bridge those gaps because she has the en energy and enthusiasm and the know-how to, to help us get there. So we need more people like Cynthia in all the sectors to, to get the job done. Thank you, Lolita. Uh, Paul Scott is asking, how do you believe that green buildings play a part in financing better cities? What should be done with the already existing infrastructure as we continue to decarbonize? Who would like to take that one? Anyone? I think Enrique should take it. <laughs> no, I believe I believe uh, uh, green buildings, of course, are important. And then sometimes green is very simple. For example, in Bogota, we have a almost perfect temperature. Uh, we have like a 70 degree years, 70 degrees all year round. We, we that's all, all heating or air conditioning everywhere in the world is set to the Bogota temperature. Yet, there are some buildings which were so poorly designed that sometimes they need heating or cooling. Uh, so clearly, green buildings can be very helpful. Uh, and uh, all that can be done to promote them, uh, especially in areas where, where, where uh, heating or air conditioning is needed, is very important for, for uh, to prevent the global warming and, and, and all that. However, uh, I like to emphasize that to me, the, my, my main interest is in, in developing countries and everywhere in the world, the main problem for that it cre is creating global warming is that cities are growing in the wrong places. Cities are growing in the wrong places, even in the United States, because uh, the, 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 instead of, uh, there have been uh, some important changes in some cities recently, but mostly uh, we have a lot of low density uh, uh, homes relatively near the center and the city continues to go grow farther and farther away, creating uh, the need for driving and uh, all that. But in the developing world, uh, uh, I mentioned, Everywhere, it was mentioned that uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, we should do case studies or something. Well, every developing world city has informal developments, illegal developments. Everywhere, they grow in the wrong places, everywhere. So it cannot be just because people are stupid everywhere or they are corrupt everywhere. It's because the system, the system does not work the private property and the market do not work because while some few landowners, wealthy landowners, they keep, they speculate with the land where the city should grow, the poor people are forced to uh, 
terrible places where there is very high risk. But not only that, even private, legal private developments, because the land, when the land is so expensive, they are forced to go very far away from cities, very far away from cities to, to, to do the housing, to do the housing for the people. And this, of course, creates horrible need for, uh, needs to use cars, and it creates much more higher energy consumption. And uh, so I think the most important thing in this moment in the developing world, and I would say almost everywhere in the world, is for cities to grow in the right places. And I would say in the right way too, with enough public spaces and all that. And for this, the only, the, clearly there is a contradiction between private decisions and government decisions. I think this clearly is something that has to be done with a perspective on public good. Uh, and this can only be done through whatever we call government. And uh, this can be, and this sometimes I, I believe it has to be regional or national governments because many times the municipalities themselves have decisions that are very uh, contradictory with the public good. Sometimes there are municipalities which are very well located, but they do not want a housing development in their, in their, in their territory, especially they do not want low income people to go to their municipality. So they establish many rules to keep low income housing from being built in those municipalities. For example, they decide that the, 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 the housing must be very large or the land plots must be very large or so. And I think this is, this is uh, I, of course, I believe that, that the, the, the well-designed sustainable housing is very important, very important. Uh, but I think at this time, something that which is much more obvious, what generates uh, global warming what generates electricity consumption in developing countries, it is much more than the heating or the cooling, is transportation. Transportation. And for this, we must design cities where, di where uh, distances are minimized and uh, it is possible to move by public transport, low cost, high frequency public transport, bicycles, walking, all of these sustainable modes of transport. And for this, clearly, I, I think this is massive what is coming to the world at this moment, massive. Today, as we talk, there are cities are growing in the wrong places and millions are going into slums in horrible places, uh, flood, high flood risk places. Clearly, this is, go, doing, this is not working. Uh, and so I believe, uh, this is, this is not to minimize the importance of, of sustainable buildings, extremely important, especially, again, I say, where there is winter and summer and all that. But uh, at least we should begin for cities to be growing in the right places. Enrique, you're absolutely right. And we have among us some um, PhD students who are looking at the question of informality, which you brought up uh, in your conversation. We know, of course, that you were a great advocate in making transportation in the right places with your, with your bike routes and the metro and so forth. But I'd like to call on Kimberly Naronha, who is an advanced PhD student. After all, the youth are going to change the world for us. So Kimberly, let us know uh, some of your views on informality and the growth of cities. Um, thank you very much, Jeannie. Uh, and um, uh, Mayor, that was, in, that was an interesting perspective, but um, respectfully, I would push back on one point that informality, I agree with you on the point that informa informality is a structural issue, but I also think that we need to broaden how we look at informality to beyond just settlements. People who are informal uh, work informally as well on the streets around uh, cities in the developing world. And I think that climate change needs to, climate change specialists and finance need to consider this entire universe of what it means to be informal. 
not just where people live, because of, although those are based decisions and that's very easy for city managers and planners to target right in the beginning. So I, I would love to hear your views on not just where cities are structurally located in the wrong way, but also how cities have not been dealing with the livelihoods of, the, of people who work informally. And therefore uh, we should consider that within our climate change financing uh, gamut as well. It's a small problem for people who are looking at it globally with a 30,000 foot view, for, but for a lot of people, my country, for example, has 90% people working informally. This is not going away tomorrow. So how are we going to deal with this um, and consider climate finance with that as well? Thank you. Any reaction to that, Enrique? Well, first of all, uh, the, the most of the informal work is not just the one in the streets. That's a, a very small minority. It's very visible, but that's not the main informal work that we have in developing cities. I mean, developing uh, informal work is almost everything. And the, and the only real way to, to overcome that is with more economic development, more economic development uh, to facilitate investment, to, to promote so that we sometimes there are too many regulations. Uh, for example, sometimes minimum wages are too high, so it makes it very difficult to formalize or taxes are too high. Uh, so some, some regulations must be eased for informal work to, to become formal as, as soon as possible so that people can actually have, uh, for example, uh, uh, pensions after they, when they, in for their old age or so that they have good health. Uh, for this is a completely different subject. We could go forever. For example, Colombia, uh, because this is a completely different issue. You know, uh, Colombia, for example, has the best health coverage, uh, insurance coverage in any developing country of a similar income level. 98% of Colombians have access to health coverage through an, a, a system which uh, is, a, is mixed private and public. And so low income people are, can access not only public hospitals, but also private hospitals and even the same hospitals where even the wealthy people go through an insurance system. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which uh, these informal workers are covered. They are, they are uh, and they also, we, they, they are, of course, we would like to have much better system, but for elderly people to also get a pension, uh, even though they have not uh, made the, the, have not participated in a, in a pension system through their lives to have a minimum pension, these things have to be worked on. In this area, Colombia has a big challenge. We are very well covered in the health area, but very poor uh, uh, coverage. Only about 25% of Colombians have a, a, a true uh, 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 pension. And so this is, this is something that, that uh, has to be worked on, but, but has to be mainly with how to achieve economic development, how to get a higher productivity, how to get more investment, this is a, another issue altogether, which we could address, but it would take a whole different event. Uh, Cynthia, uh, you certainly must be, have a chapter or some coverage of informality from the point of view of, of what you're doing. Yes, I am um, in uh, the, actually bringing the three things together. The, the title, the working title of the group that the group has come onto, and we'd very much like to have um, um uh is it your first the first name of uh kimberly uh, Kim? kimberly kimberly we want you to come and be part of it um it's called equity informality and development because the authors felt at, i really echoing uh kimberly's point that all of this needs to be um uh uh really um uh, considered in an integrated way. And by the way, this also echoes uh, the, the IPCC Working Group 2 report that came out just a few weeks ago. This climate resilient development, 
was one of the main themes. And again, Bill Selecki was one of the um, key people there bringing, bringing this, developing this concept. So um, um, I, I, I think it's a very important point. We, yes, and the authors also, um, for example, Diana Reckian, um, who was um, uh, a CLA, for um, for one of the uh, IPCC chapters that just came out is one of the leads in Shweb Luasa also. We have and a wonderful team of, of equity informality. And it's just so interesting that that's, I believe, I think it's very telling that they brought those three concepts together and that's what they're addressing in the chapter. So Kimberly, we're gonna get, get, get we, want to, we would love for you to be part of it. Thanks. Uh, thank you for bringing up that chapter 18, which is entitled uh, Climate Resilient Development, which is attempting to bring together the funding for climate and development as one. And I think Michael Berkowitz is shaking his head here, shaking it affirmatively. Would you like to add a, a, a comment on that, Michael? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, not, not, I, we're going to have a whole session on it, so right. but I, I do see those two issues as inextricably linked, as we've talked about. And this is really the question of de-siloing. Um, how do we see our climate challenges as inextricably linked to our development challenges and vice versa? And that's hard because we need to focus on one or the other often. Um, but we'll talk about ways, some, some ways in which cities and other you know, actors are approaching that. Right, and some financial structures are established to separate them purposely, and not, we will talk about that later, but basically for prohibiting funding used for development to be counted as climate and vice versa. Uh, so when we talked about inventing new ways of financing um, uh, urban adaptation, uh, this obviously is one stream that we need to talk about, um, uh, of course. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Jeannie and Michael. Uh, Carla Mays, uh, you have a comment. Could you please share it with everybody? Carla, are you there? <laughs> she's been very active in the chat, so maybe yes. she's stepped yes. away for a minute. Um, but one of the things she's been extremely concerned about has been diversity and how we are within this discussion uh, encompassing diversity um, and equity issues. Cynthia began to address that. Would you like to comment on that, uh, Cynthia, please? You know, this should be like the number one topic always now. It just completely has to be. Um, uh, again, I mean, uh, I'm just, you, you know, just in US cities, and I know this is a global discussion and an international discussion, but just the history of um, the effects of redlining, um, basically ha in the in the United States, in the cities in the United States, it it just permeates every un, our un, you know it has to permeate our understanding of of vulnerability to climate as well as all of the uh, uh, economic livelihood. Uh, issues. But um, yeah, so for example, we're um, with all during COVID, um, uh, we, uh, we have, we, we got together a team to look at climate stresses and COVID um, in a compound risk scape analysis um, uh, in New York. And immediately the, the history of redlining came up. You basically now, I think, can't understand um, climate, the challenges for uh, climate impacts on urban areas that need the resilience and adaptation without this lo really longer term view. And I know internationally with uh, there, there's, uh, it, it may be, it, it may be different mechanisms, different, some of the things that Enrique, I think, has been talking about, about, um, uh, the effects of, uh, private sector on, uh, on city, on urban development. But I just, that's what I would say. I think we now basically fundamentally, this has to be taken in to account 
everywhere in every city now and almost fundamentally and first. There's a straight line, Cynthia, and Enrique, one could draw from the redlining lessons that you're talking about, Cynthia, in the United States and the informality issues that we have in the developing world, because so many of the informal settlements are located in less desirable places, yeah. uh, as were the redlined places, which became either were undesirable or became undesirable by virtue of this regulation and this process of administration. So I guess the question is, what can we learn today from what we saw in the past that might be applied to thinking about financing urban adaptation for cities as a whole when you have vulnerable populations living in, in difficult areas. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Enrique. No, just uh, two seconds, uh, because this is what you mentioned is the most important issue, Ginny. This is uh, uh, what is sad is that, for example, uh, some there is very few advantage of being poor and backward and being behind. Uh, almost only disadvantages, but one of them is that one should be able to learn from those which have gone before. So your question is, what can we have? What have we learned from what has happened in the in the urbanization process over the last fifty years, for example? And clearly, so when I look at Africa and even many Asian countries. Latin America now is 80% urban, uh, but many Asian countries only 50% and uh, Africa even sometimes less. And we know that those cities are going to grow in the same way Latin American cities grew over the last 50, 60, 70 years. They are going to grow five times, 10 times, 15 times, 15 times. So 90% uh, of the city, which will be in a, they will exist in 2060 in Africa, it has not been built. Uh, so the sad thing is that instead of making something different and better, we are doing the same stupid mistakes as we made. Uh, and clearly I believe the most important thing, again, there are many things we can talk about how cities grow, whether we, we have, should have large sidewalks with trees, or we have, we could have, for example, in new cities, we could have a whole network of greenways crisscrossing cities so that we could go across cities in a bicycle uh, under trees, on, on, under uh, uh, tree shaded greenways crisscrossing the cities in all directions with cars next to them. It's very easy to do something like this and doesn't have any cost. If we are doing about new cities, this is very difficult to implement in Manhattan or in London, but it's very easy to implement in the areas of cities which have not yet been created. Uh, but the most important thing, again, I mentioned is the obvious thing is where should cities grow? Where is the good places for cities to grow? And then the second part, which is also very important is how? How do we have all these greenways or large parks or whatever? But clearly we are not doing it. And I believe again, even though it may be boring as I mentioned, reiterate the same issue. The, the most important thing is the land issue, the private land issue around cities. Clearly the market does not work in the case of land around growing cities. The market does not work and it produces results which are terrible. It forces the people to go to the worst places. Sometimes even the private sector is for, and the legal sector is forced to go to the wrong places. So clearly uh, we have learned, we can learn many, many, many things. The question you say, it would be very interesting. As you say, if we could go, I always dream and I try many times I spoke in Asia and to tell them, look of all the mistakes we made, you can avoid them and look at all, but no. We ourselves don't avoid them and we are still growing them. It's so difficult to change things, you know, because we ourselves, we see what we have done wrong and we continue to do the same thing. Uh, and so you're, 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 it would be very interesting if we stop for a, for a few moments and say, well, what have we done wrong? What could we, what could have we done better? What, have, what can we learn from what we have done? And how can we avoid it? This is very important and we are not doing it enough. So in the last three minutes, I'm going to ask this question to you two as mayors. 
how do you address the political issues surrounding what we know needs to be done with good good development we we know how to do it right just as enrique told us just now but you have to deal with the politics of your cities how do you manage the messaging how do you manage the um the various forces that you are uh, dealing with within your cities when you try to promote these messages which you both have done in your careers well i'll, I'll take that one Jeannie. i think that <laughs> uh, when uh, addressing urban adaptation we are uh, facing um two big problems for, for a mayor particularly in the developing world on the one hand you need to convince the population about the importance of adaptation projects, which may not be very visible. So that's why many mayors in the world don't undertake adaptation projects because they are just not politically profitable. And that's a big challenge. Uh, so number one, how to convince people that this is important and needs to be done. And the second problem is the one of finance. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, cities are dealing with a financial system that was not designed for cities, it was designed for countries. We need to make it more cities friendly. Uh, we are facing a system in which cities in many countries around the world need to get a national guarantee to access international finance, a national guarantee that might not be granted because of political rivalries between the national and the local government. And this is happening every single day. So we need to promote deep reforms to the international financial system to make it more cities friendly if we un understand the important, the key role that cities must play to tackle climate change. Enrique, would you like to add something to that? Yes, I, I just to say that uh, uh, the first we are, confronting very difficult issues. First, for example, the fact that uh, uh, government terms are very short, four years. And for example, in Bogota, there is no immediate re-election. And all of these projects are projects which are uh, for, for decades. As I mentioned, cities should be planned for the next 70 years or so. I mean, I am, I'm always amazed how Barcelona or New York had plans to multiply 10 times their area in a, around 1810 or something like this or, and now. So first, long-term planning is necessary. Uh, second, uh, we, we face two obstacles. Some, one is the obvious one, the landowners, the powerful people who own land, who they, they want to make a lot of money just uh, sitting on their land and getting rich as the rest of society works and makes their land become more valuable. But then we find another obstacle, which is some idealist, pseudo-environmentalist, pseudo-environmentalist that they say they would like cities not to grow. So it's just ridiculous. So they, unfortunately, the cities will grow. They forget that in the, in the building where they live, there used to be a forest. And, the, and then, uh, of course, they could live under a tree, but they live in an apartment. And so we have these two, these two opponents of long-term planning. Some people who just, they would love cities for cities not to grow, but unfortunately they have to grow. Uh, and, uh, and the others, the landowners. But, uh, and finally, to relate to the topic of the, of the event today, again, as the finance, the finance issue for cities is not just, as Mauricio says, it's not just that, that the systems are designed to finance national governments and not cities, but the international financial system, both private and multilateral, does not finance really the acquisition of land for long-term use. I say, let's say World Bank, I need to buy the land for my city to grow for the next 70 years. And I don't even need to buy all the land. I need to buy a, a significant part of it. So I have an, a, a significant uh, incidence in the market. I mean, we were able to do projects. We were able to do projects as in my two terms as mayor for about half a million people, housing for housing for half a million people with very, very high quality planning. But still, it's very difficult. It's very precious, short, short terms as mayor and all that. And again, 
So if, if we are talking about the long-term planning, we need first long-term planning. So uh, second, constitutional means so that allow governments to truly control where cities grow and so that they cannot grow anywhere else. And third, ideally, there should be financial mechanisms that allow you to, the same way that, people, that these institutions finance, if you want, you want to make a subway or you want to make a road or you want to make something, that you, they should be able to finance land acquisition for long-term use. 